Hi, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Explicitly pro Life Podcast. I'm Kristen Hawkins. Today, we have a very special episode. I'm super excited about my guest who's come on, a good friend, Ryan Bomberger, co-founder of the Radiance Foundation, because today we're going to talk about the abortion movement's history of racism. So this is going to be a big episode, one you're definitely going to want to tune into. Before I do that, I'm advertising. I know we're not like officially like legit, I guess, as a podcast because I'm not sponsored by anything yet. I mean, I'm sure, Ryan, your podcast, you have some sponsors. But we are going to advertise the Students for Life face mask. Yes, that's right. You can get your pro-life face mask at SFLA Shop if you have to wear a face mask. It might as well be a pro-life one. We have four of them because I couldn't decide which one I like better. So we have Make Abortion Illegal Again, Make America Pro-Life Again, and Vote Pro-Life First, just in the Trump font is what I call it. And then we also have the standard black, I am the pro-life generation. So make sure you go to SFLA shop, get your face mask. I've got all of them. All right, Ryan, you are coming on. You are our guest. Super excited. You are our, our expert in this uh, topic, and you've been talking about this since forever, since we first met. But I want to introduce your, you to our audience in case they've never met you, which is a real shame if they haven't. So Ryan Bomberger is a co-founder of the Radiance Foundation. He's an adoptee, an adoptive father. Um, he's an Emmy award-winning creative professional, a columnist. He calls himself a factivist. Um, he's also the author of the powerful new book, uh, Not Equal, Civil Rights Gone Wrong. Uh, and because he's such a creative, he already has it positioned right there in his shot. Everyone's going to know what it looks like. The branding is on point. Yes, there we go. And he's even wearing a Radiance Foundation shirt. All right. So he founded Radiance Foundation with his wife, Bethany. Um, and it's really funny. In the bio, it says with his current wife, Bethany. So I don't know if you're planning on... Uh... <laughs> You and Bethany have an announcement. But he and his wife, Bethany, uh, founded Radiance Foundation. It's a life-affirming organization. If you don't follow Radiance Foundation, you definitely need to follow them on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, are you on Twitter, Ryan? For now, yeah. For, okay, for, for now. now. I know, for, for now. Um, but they put out some amazing materials for the pro-life movement. They put out pro-life billboards. Um, and they do some incredible um presentations that just really elevates the pro-life movement, I think, to the next level. Um, Ryan also has a very personal story. He goes and speaks across the country. Many Students for Life groups have hosted them. I know a lot of pregnancy centers uh, host he and his wife. Ryan was conceived in rape, but adopted in love. Uh, so Ryan's life is an amazing example uh, of what love can do. Um, he is one of 10 children who all were adopted in love and has an incredibly diverse family of 15. And it's amazing. I think you guys just had a big like family reunion because I saw some pictures. It was like everyone was on like a stage or something. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, the Christmas at the, the Bomberger house must have been insane. It is. There are a few people. Not too much. <laughs> and, chaos, you're, and you have four children or three. Children? I know. I only have four. I'm from a family. Only 15, have four. So I feel like I have a small family. I, that's how it is in pro-life movement. My, my family goes, you have four children. Like, what were you thinking? And then I go to pro-life events, and they're like, oh, you only have four? <laughs> I like, I it's can't. I don't, which one? Yeah. And uh, I forgot to mention in your bio, you and Bethany have a brand new podcast. What's it called, and how can people tune in? Sure. It's called Life as Purpose, and they can tune in on any every major podcast platform or just go to lifeaspurpose.com. So you're really my competitor. I'm bringing my competitor <laughs> on this podcast. Great. We, we love each other, though. Yeah, so it's great. all good. <laughs> Apparently, my podcast is number 18 in government and U.S. politics. So. Oh, excuse me. I don't I know don't what know our rank is. Happens, I haven't checked but, it yet. But. but maybe you're in a different category, so then we're not really competitors. So I don't hey. We're going to talk about abortion and racism. I think this is an incredibly difficult subject for a lot of people to talk about, um, especially if you're like me and white. It kind of can get intimidating. People, I've had a lot of pro-life activists over the years say, I know all this terrible stuff about Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood, but I can't talk about that, right? Um, so, but no, that's wrong. Like, we need to be talking about it. And especially right now when this, there's like this incredible moment 
where we're having a very important conversation about race in our country, we really need to be bringing into light the fact that every single day Planned Parenthood is killing 360 black children. Um, so I guess my question to you is, when did you first get clued into the abortion, you know, the, the abortion movement's history of racism? Was that like your first kind of way you got into the pro-life movement or were you already pro-life and then discovered, oh my gosh, this is all, this is racist business practices? Yeah, well, I would say that I was pro-life pretty much all my life. Having been adopted into a family of 15, that definitely set the course in a particular direction. But it really was actually in eighth grade when I discovered the actual story of how I came to be, when I learned that I was conceived in rape. That's really when I felt like I had a story to tell. And so that pro-life, that public pro-life mm -hmm. factivism started way back then. But it, when we started the Radiance Foundation, we knew so little about Planned Parenthood. We knew so little about even the pro-life movement, but we wanted to tackle these tough issues. And it was actually meeting with Katherine Davis, uh, who heads up the Restoration Project, when I met with her about a billboard campaign that I had designed and, and a, you know, the Too Many Aborted.com billboard campaign that she told me about Maafa 21. I'm like, Ma, what a? Maafa 21.com. It's how you can see that documentary. Mm -hmm. I watched that and got such an incredibly thorough history of eugenics in America, that's really where I started to understand. And then it prompted me to dig deeper. So, you know, out of our billboard campaign, then we were highlighting some of the things that we had learned from the documentary. Thank you, Mark Crutcher and Life Dynamics. But that was such an education. Didn't get it in public school, didn't get it in a Christian college, didn't get it <laughs> through our fake news media, but I definitely got it through, I think one of the best documentaries mm -hmm. in, uh, that, that deals with American history that I've ever seen. Yeah, and I would encourage you all, if you've never heard of Ma'afa 21, Ma'afa is a Swahili word for great tragedy. Um, and so if you, it's M-A-A-F-A-21.com. And originally it was like out on DVD, but now they, Mark okay. Crutcher and his team of Life Dynamics has made it digital. And you can watch, I think it's like two and a half, three hours. It's, it's, it is so complex. They've detailed it, but they've They've really, they distilled down all of these different narratives and shown the timeline, but it really starts out with Darwin, Darwin's cousin, uh, who kind of founded the modern eugenics movement, coined that mm -hmm. term, and how eugenics spread like a wildfire, uh, and really what happened in, in America. And that's when, what we often, you hear the pro-life movement talking about Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist. And so they really describe what eugenics is and what eugenics believers promoted and how Planned Parenthood, you know, was started with this entire mindset that there are certain people that shouldn't have the opportunity to reproduce and that we should be able to control who's reproducing because if we can control who's reproducing, we can basically change the entire stock of the human race and elevate that stock. And that's right. exactly why this American Birth Control League, which later became Planned Parenthood, was founded. So it's if you want to watch like the entire history in like two and a half hours. And I think for me, what was really shocking is states had eugenics boards. And Oregon was the last state to disband their eugenics board. And it was in 1980, like 1980. You were alive, right? Right, right. I That's was crazy. Alive, I'm just saying, but you were alive. I, okay. I was alive. Yes, I'm. I'm a slightly older than than you. <laughs> but are. I mean, that's crazy. I think in 1980, there was a state eugenics board that was their whole purpose was making sure that we increase the stock of the people being born. Right. Oh, the, the okay. stock of the desired people or the desired traits. You know, very. It's a very anti-human ideology. And so when you learn about the history of eugenics. I mean, it's it's shocking, one, that it's not just some archaic ideology. It is alive and tragically well today. Can you, um, I guess, so you learned about when, I remember when you first started Raiden's Foundation, you launched the Tume Board and Billboard campaign. Um, I remember taking you around to one of the pro-life meetings and trying to be like, don't talk to this person. Be careful what you, don't say this to that person. Make sure you don't put these two people in the same room together. And we were talking about the pro-life movement, how the people work, work together. You were, you were pretty new to the movement. I think I probably scared you a lot in that, that first time we met. Um, but you started learning about the racism of the abortion industry. I guess, what do you wish the pro-life movement would do a better job when it comes to the racism of the abortion 
uh, movement. What do you wish we would do a better job of communicating out to the rest of the world? I think that, especially in the times that we're in right now, where racism is is everything, it's seen in everything, even though I, I disagree with that whole mentality. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, the pro-life movement, I think, at some time shies away from talking about the the the, the history of racist, I'm sorry, eugenic racism. Um, I'm not saying that pro-life groups have highlighted that, yes, but it's like the, the other side exploits it like crazy. And I think we just don't take advantage sometimes of historical moments when we can just say, look, we've been fighting this racism, we've been fighting this vile pseudoscience for decades. And I don't think we, we highlight that enough um, I'm grateful for your group and obviously live action and a number of other, you know, life issues institutes. There are so many others who, who are doing that. But of course, mainstream media doesn't ever give us any yeah. accolades. They don't ever pat us on the back and say, good job for highlighting that evil. But we know it. We know this history. Mm -hmm. And we know that Planned Parenthood can never separate itself from its DNA. They can take off Margaret Sanger's name from every center that they have across the United States. But changing your name doesn't change your DNA. Mm -hmm. They are still rooted in vile racism. They're rooted in elitism. They're rooted in an anti-human ideology where they get to decide which human beings are worthy of life and which ones aren't. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing for National Pro-Life Gen Sidewalk Day, we went out the beginning of August to chalk at the DC Planned Parenthood and we were going to, we wanted to paint pre Black Preborn Lives Matter. Um, you know, and we, we were stopped, oh, totally couldn't do that, even though, you know, even though the mayor had allowed other groups of people to paint without a permit and with permanent paint, and we did what they had requested and did temporary paint, right. just saying. But when our students went to go chalk, just black pre-born lives matter, they were arrested. And that's what got all the media attention, right? It really wasn't right. the message. It was that, well, it was this, we, we said a phrase of black lives matter and we were chalking and yet right. the whole city is boarded up. And, you know, I was just in DC and there's graffiti everywhere. And like, I mean, it was, I, it, it was scary being downtown DC. I was down there last night and it was scary. Like these hotels that I've gone into tons of times and, and restaurants, they're all boarded up. There's graffiti all over the place. I mean, it's like a third right. world country where you would think there's like an actual civil war and fighting happening in the streets, which, I mean, I think a lot of people are kind of saying this kind of is a civil war type of right. moment where we are fighting these ideologies. Um, but it's, it's scary. And I, that's what got the attention, though, was that they got arrested, not that, you know, that the fact that while they were being arrested, processed and set and put in the jail cell for 45 minutes by themselves, which was terrifying, um, that Planned Parenthood was killing black children and that they killed right. 360 black children the entire day. And no one else was no one else was talking about no that. one. No one bats an eyelash. I mean, I love the fact that Students for Life was calling out the hypocrisy of the Black Lives Matter movement, well, which Black Lives Matter. If the most vulnerable, most defenseless black lives don't matter, mm -hmm. then get rid of your hashtag. Because you yeah. need to say, hashtag some black lives matter. Mm -hmm. So yeah, call I mean, them out. It's, it's unbelievable. And Planned Parenthood has, and I want to go over a little bit about Planned Parenthood's racist history, I think, for sure. our listeners. If you don't want to tune into Ma'afa, which you totally should, Ma'afa 21. Um, Planned Parenthood's founder, Margaret Sanger, was a eugenicist. She proudly proclaimed it. The woman spoke at a female KKK, a women's KKK rally. Um Planned Parenthood has a one pager or, or they did a week ago. Now they may be uh, revising it because of current events, because they just had 300 employees of Planned Parenthood say they need to right. distance themselves from their racist founder. Um, but they um, have basically said in the past, and in fact, I was just looking um, online and there's a Time magazine article and the way the pro abortion liberal media kind of gets around Margaret Sanger's racism is, and this is exactly what Time Magazine just did in this article, a complicated past. Oh, it's complicated. Sure. And, yeah, it's, it, 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 no, she wasn't a racist. It was just, she was a product of her time. And that during the, you know this time in American history, all well-to-do white women had these feelings uh, towards immigrants, towards blacks, towards whoever. Uh, that people who weren't like them, who were poor. Uh, but I mean, her writing is very clear. Planned Parenthood's one pager on their website, I encourage you, they've 
since 2016, they've had a one pager on their website. Uh, thanks to some work that we were able to do with Catherine Davis, now Vita King, back in 2008 when we started doing these defund Planned Parenthood rallies in front of um, Planned Parenthoods with black pro-life leaders and uh, pre priests and pastors. Uh, so they've been kind of on the little bit more of the defense, but even their one pager doesn't. It kind of says, well, you know, she said some things that were wrong and that we today know are wrong. But for her time, she was a progressive um, and she did a lot of really great things. You know, she started this revolution of birth control, making sure women can control their destiny. OK, well, you can argue that. But the question is, well, why did she want women to control their destiny? And I mean, her right. quotes are her quotes are shocking, like pivot of civilization, her book, 1922, we are paying for and even submitting to the dictates of an ever increasing, unceasingly spawning class of human beings who never should have been born <laughs> at all. I mean, I guess whatever. I included in that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, crazy. And so, so you just said that. So you are that 1%, right? The people who say, well, I'm pro life, I'm against abortion you know, except in cases of rape. Right. But what is it when you hear someone say that, do you hear like, oh, so you mean everyone should be born except for me? Right. Every time. I mean, people say that it's one, they don't realize how callous that is. I mean, first of all, what gives you the person who is supposedly planned more value? Why do you have more value? I mean, I get that all the time. Once when I was speaking at Harvard and I'm debating this Harvard law professor, she was so condescending and constantly just said, a child who was wanted, a child who was wanted. Well, one, coming from a family of 15 with 10 of us adopted, my parents shattered that whole myth of the unwanted child. I have two adopted kids myself. There's, there's, there's no such thing as unwanted. We're all wanted by someone. But it's amazing to me that someone can just blurt that out and not understand what they're saying. They're saying, you should be dead. I mean, who goes up to somebody and says that? only someone who embraces the lie of a pro-abortion worldview and not understanding that every human life has equal and irrevocable value. Because if we don't believe that, then anybody else can take away your value. And if it's always situational, then it moves to the next group. It moves to the next group. And that's what we, we see throughout human history. Yeah. No, I mean, it never it, ends well. That's exactly, I mean, you can say, well, Margaret Singer was a, a eugenicist and all the white well-to-do women, and they were all, you know, believing that immigrants and certain people shouldn't reproduce. But what she did was really good. And, you know, abortion today isn't racist. Well, yeah, it is. Like, their entire business model, like, four out of five Planned Parenthoods today are located in minority-dense populations, meaning right. women can walk to them from minority-dense populations. Right. Right. The, the abortion rate for black women to white women, I think, is five times higher. Right. Uh, 30 percent of all abortions are committed on black women when black women are 13 percent of the population. I mean, like you keep going like it's very clear who they're targeting that. Yes, they had a racist past. And maybe you, Miss Receptionist, who's working at Planned Parenthood, d don't aren't racist. I'm not saying you are, but you are, in fact, working for a racist organization because right. abortion is racism right but it's just too complex you can't really understand which i i love that whole defense because then why are we tearing down statues of thomas jefferson why are oh, we tearing down statues of christopher columbus too, right? oh well that whole nonsense i didn't know that truth was relegated to a particular color thank god for william wilberforce who was white thank god for harriet beecher stowe a white woman oh she can't talk about issues. Well, she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin and changed an entire nation because of that. So anybody who feels like, oh, I'm, I'm just not the right person, forget that nonsense. It's because of your voice you're able to break through and literally change culture. That's right. I mean, we hear this, you know, it's like arguments aren't, can't be gendered, right? So like we've heard this argument with men. Well, I can't say anything. Right. I'm against abortion, but I can't say anything because, you know, I don't know what it's like to be pregnant. I'm like, no, no, you can have an opinion. Your argument isn't based on your gender. You know, there's not female arguments and male arguments. There's not right. female truth and male truth. There is just the truth. Amen. Uh, <laughs> same thing with skin color. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating, but I do think a lot of white pro-lifers feel like, well, I can't talk about Planned Parenthood's racism. I do, I'm, I have to admit, it sounds, 
in the past when I've tried to talk about Planned Parenthood's racism, talking about Margaret Sanger's founder or Margaret Sanger, one of her friends, Lothrop's daughter, who she put on the board of Planned Parenthood, who they right. co-wrote together. I mean, this man, Google Lothrop's daughter's quotes. I mean, he was a best-selling author. I mean, he, you think Margaret Sanger's quotes are bad and her views on race? You yeah. should you should read Lothrop's daughter. Um, and so, it, but it almost sounds like, so it sounds like you're a conspiracy theorist. Like you're going to start talking about Area 51 after you yeah. talk. Because people have such like, uh, have in the past, have had such a positive view of Planned Parenthood. And you're trying to like, you're, you're trying to get people to understand like, it's not all what's cracked up to be. And it's really just a pretty facade. It's, right. it's just a facade. And really inside what they're doing is practicing racism every single day and tearing apart human children. Like, you can't make that pretty. Um, right. So yeah. It's called history. History yeah. is what we're talking about. I mean, you got people talking today about, you know, passing laws to stop history classes in public schools because it centers on white supremacy. Well, I guess part of that white supremacy was this distortion of Planned Parenthood's history, completely ignoring the fact that it was rooted in racism. I mean, Lothrop Stoddard was, you know, what was he, a grand cyclops? Is that yeah. uh, of the KKK? I love their... He's insulting. like grand, yeah. I mean, it's Something. like, I think it might be Cyclops. I don't know. <laughs> right. But I mean, these are people, I, this is all historical. This is all so well documented. His book was called The Rising Tide of Color Against White uh, World Supremacy. Um, you can't take that any other way. I mean, it was such a deeply racist book. These are the people that Margaret Sanger didn't just associate with. These were the people that she was inextricably tied to, that she joined, she united with to put forth a deeply racist movement, which was the birth control movement. And Planned Parenthood, their little one pager that I said they have on their website, their their way they they um, you know, kind of wash that away is they say, well, you know, she worked with everyone to build consensus, and it, she didn't care, you know, where they were. She wanted to work with everyone. I'm like, oh yeah, so you just kind of hang out with racist KK and KKK <laughs> members, uh, just. For fun, right. like, I want to end abortion, but I'm sorry if a KKK rally asked me to go speak and say, Kristen, will you come and talk about ending abortion at our KKK women's rally? Yeah. I would say no. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a certain line that, you know, I want to work with Democrats. I want to work with atheists. I'll work with pretty much about anybody as long as you're nonviolent and not advocating for the destruction of whole species. Right. Like, a species. like right. it, Oh, it's so frustrating. It's very frustrating. It, I, it's crazy. All the justifications. I mean, this is what happens when you're a pro-abortion. You have to twist yourself into all kinds of rhetorical knots. And then you're like, wait a minute, what was the last lie? What was the last ridiculous thing I said? How in the world can you even follow any of it? There's no logic to it. They wouldn't excuse away, which is why I love you mentioned the, the Planned Parenthood employees that just called out Planned Parenthood of Great Greater New York. It was that affiliate. Who call them. But the thing that's so frustrating is that they'll call out the racism of their present CEO, they'll call out the racism of their founder, but they don't see the inherent racism in the hugely disproportionate number of black babies being killed. In New York, for every 1,000 black babies born, 1,033 are aborted. That's the last report from the New York City Department of, of Health. They don't see what is so obvious. I mean, Planned Parenthood literally kills more black lives in two weeks than the KKK did in an entire century. 3,446 black lives killed by the KKK, killed by those who lynched them. And that's, that doesn't include the white lives who were also killed. We mm -hmm. have to remember that because white advocates mm -hmm. for justice and equality also died alongside their black brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So for me, this whole pro-life fight is us walking hand in hand in a multi-generational, multi-ethnic fight. Mm -hmm. And we are the ones who are fighting racism. And yeah. the ultimate end of the racism, what is the ultimate end of, of the ultimate consequence? It's death. That's what it's always been in American history. It's been death. So we fight it peacefully, Absolutely. of course. Absolutely. I mean, there's your marching orders from Ryan Bomber. Fight it. Keep talking about it. I mean, I think that's what's so, is, is really what's so needed right now is that you've got to keep talking about this issue. And the fact that Planned Parenthood's own employees now are saying, you know, we need to acknowledge this. We need to, you know, distance ourselves from Margaret Sanger. Um, that's a real problem for Planned Parenthood. I mean, the, the cracks are starting to really show in the Planned Parenthood's 
you know, a little foundation there. Right. And if I were, you know, on their board of directors, I'd be very nervous. Like word is starting to get out. You know, Margaret Sanger's quote is, we don't want word to get out. What we want to do is exterminate the Negro population. Word is getting out. They're get, it's getting out, right? right? I stop myself. It's explicitly pro-life. I try not to be too explicit. <laughs> explicit. I, I, th- th- we, we call explicitly pro-life. That way, if I slip up, it's okay. Right. But I'm not supposed to be intentional about being. It's like the disclaimer. So, yeah, here, I have to, like, stop myself. With, here's the thing about Margaret Sanger and which Planned Parent, which which Margaret Sanger Planned Parent celebrates. Is it the one that yeah. talked about with birth control that it was to prevent the birth of defectives? Was it the anti-immigration one, the deeply racist one? Was it the one who said that thousands of abortions a year are disgraced to civilization? Which one? Of course, she was duplicitous, so she would say one thing in public and do yeah. something totally different in private. But which Margaret Sanger, oh, or or the one who headlines an event? you know, KKK event or other ones like that in our autobiography, which Margaret Sanger are they celebrating? I, Who knows? Yeah. But you're right. They, they do this themselves all the time, right? Uh, right. They tw- have to twist themselves into this nonsensical logic that right. is to- totally doesn't make sense. They'll say one thing and then, you know, but it, so it kind of makes sense that they would be that way with Margaret Sanger. Right. All right. So I, I guess I want to move on from, I think everyone listening should get this. The abortion movement is racist. Like, and if you haven't figured it out yet, Google it, watch Moffat 21. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about racism from people who believe that they're pro-life. And this is kind of, kind of sensitive, but I have heard, I have been in conversations with people who are against abortion, who are like at events, or they, they may not be like at a pro-life event, they're not like full-fledged working in the pro-life movement, but they, they're at a conservative Republican event, or they're somewhere with where I'm at, right? So it's, you know, if I'm somewhere, it's probably we're conservative or something political or something religious. And I'll hear comments like, well, you know, don't those people just know there's birth control? And I, it's, it's almost, and I've had to stop some people and say, can you back up what you just said? Because it sounds a little bit to me like a racist remark. Have you, have you experienced that in conversations with folks of just, I, I don't think they understand what it is they're saying, but, and so I try to get them to pause and back up to what they're saying, but it, it's, it's very, I would say it's a racist remark. I think there are times, I guess we have to distinguish between what might be racist and what might be insensitive. Okay, that's probably better. I mean, I I know as pro-lifers, we're we're perfect in every way, right? We're little angels. (laughs) Well, you know, and we are imperfect. And sometimes it just takes somebody just illuminating something like that to say, you know, that could be racially insensitive or that might be a racist remark that you're making. And someone may not ever have intended that, Mm -hmm. but that's part of why without fixating on, because this is my problem, we fixate so much sometimes on race, which is of course a human construct, it's a social construct, and it's always been destructive. It's never actually elevated humanity to, hey, let's separate everybody into different racial categories, but I think there are times, right. But what's frustrating is that we have to illuminate, especially when we have a a mainstream media, an entertainment establishment, a corporate America that's pushing race, 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 racism on us, that we do have to be aware of it. And yes, I do think there are times that when we engage in conversations, we can help elevate some of our, our fellow you know, pro-lifers. And this is not pro-life leaders, because I, I don't hear this from pro-life leaders at all. Because you know how the left is always trying to say these alt-right people, they're, they're leaders in the pro-life movement. I've never... I've never seen any of these people. They're not part of the movement. Yeah. It is not the leadership. It's not any oh. of our organizations. But there are people. I, the whole thing is what what we do and why we do what we do is because we're constantly educating people. We're educating ourselves as well. Right. And so I think these are beautiful moments where if we hear certain things like that in our presentations or maybe in one-on-one conversations, we're able to, to illuminate to somebody why that's really not a great mentality to have. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, there are so many people who are so receptive. I mean, Students for Life has these conferences. We get to speak in college uh, campuses, the Radiance Foundation. And there are so many people who come up afterward and say, I never knew that. I never knew that. And so this is what we do. We we just, small victories all the time. Yeah, we just keep having these conversations. I just, 
I think it's an interesting thought about how birth control has the birth control mindset has sort of it is rooted a lot in this racist principle and, and I think that's the point I was trying to get I, I was probably doing it pretty ineloquently because I didn't think about before I said it which I'm working on thinking about things before I say things especially when they can be inflammatory as what I've been told from our press folks but um I it's 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 it always comes out of a birth control mindset it's right. a well, you know, we really can't reduce poverty if these people would just use more birth control, if right. these people would just use birth control. Or, yeah. you know, if you're if you're so pro-life, then why aren't you just pushing birth control? Because then we could really eliminate poverty in our country. Back up what you just said there. Right. You know, who are you referring to that should be using birth control? And is it because they're poor? Because someone's living in poverty therefore they're not they shouldn't be have the same ability to reproduce and create a legacy and a family right. like how is someone's bank account number determine how many children they can have but you hear it from the right and you hear it from the left have you ever with radiance foundation have you ever started to to talk about that of this birth control mindset of, well, we can eliminate these problems if only some people would just use birth control. Because that was Margaret Sanger's approach here. Right. And I mean, her her racism and elitism would shine through all of her, her remarks in her books. But I find it far more on the left. <clears throat> in fact, when I spoke at um, Georgia State University, I, I'll never forget, there were a bunch of uh, white student activists <laughs> who were in front with a banner, unfurled this banner and said, <clears throat> trust black women. And mm -hmm. yet there were black women in the audience telling them to sit down and be quiet because they wanted to hear the presentation. <laughs> <clears throat> and one of the activists walked up, walked up to a young black woman and she said, but you need birth control. First of all, how insanely <laughs> condescending is that? But I hear this so much more from the left. The left that's always talking about not only how black community needs more birth control, but how they need abortion. Remember when Planned Parenthood came out with that crockumentary, A Vital Service? Well, what is a vital service? Uh, their abortions in the black community. They came out with that in 2012, in, in part in response to the Ratings Foundation's um, Too Many Aborted.com billboard campaign. But in that, what is the vital service? Why does the black community need more abortion? The, communities that are ravaged, whether they're black, white, or any human in between, communities that are already ravaged by violence, by fatherlessness, by higher crime, they don't need more death. So. I feel like I hear it so much more from the left. That's what, you know, these efforts to to rescind the, the Hyde Amendment and the Dornan Amendment, they want to erase these things, saying that black women need more abortions. Well, if, if the abortion rate is already five times higher in the black community than the majority population, what is the right number? What is, what is the number that's enough abortions? Because <laughs> apparently it's not enough. So I feel like the racism is so much more from the left that's constantly saying, this community, you know, you people with this color skin, mm. you need birth control. And if you don't get birth control, you have to have abortion. You need it. No, no community needs more death. That's a great line to use. Well, how how many abortions do you think is enough? What, you know, what do you think the abortion percentage should be amongst African-American women? No, it's with the, the Hyde and Dorn and, and just to kind of back up and explain that. So there are um, basically amendments, rules in place in Washington, D.C. that make sure that taxpayer dollars can't be explicitly funding abortions except right. in cases of rape, incest, or the life of the mother. Um, now, states still fund abortion. Many states actually still fund abortion in their state Medicaid. It just means that when the federal Medicaid, Medicaid's a block grant. So you get like, it's a matching grant. Half comes from the feds, half comes from the states. So it just means that, you know, when the money flows to California from Medicaid, the federal money can't be used for abortions, but the state Medicaid money can be used for abortions. Um, and so there's these amendments, and these have been like since 1976. This has been mm. bipartisan. You know, Bill Clinton said he was in favor of the Hyde Amendment. Barack Obama, both times he ran for president. It wasn't until the end of his his second term he finally came out against it. Both times he ran for president, said he was in favor of the Hyde Amendment, that pro-life Americans should not be forced to fund abortions. Like, that's like a pretty common sense thing, thing that like over 80% right. of Americans agree with, by the way. But there's this new campaign. It's called, I think it's like hashtag be, be bold and hide. And the whole argument is that 
the Hyde Amendment mm. is racist uh, because yes. black women are poor. Black women, therefore, can't get the abortions they need. So if you are against taxpayer-funded abortion, I know you have to like really spell out this insan- insanity. If you're against taxpayer-funded abortions, you are racist. Because, racist. Because black women are disproportionately poor and therefore they, they need abortion. It's so insane. Look at New York City, Kristen, for instance. New York City, when I mentioned there were 1,033 black babies aborted for every 1,000 born alive. Well, in among whites, it's 255 white babies aborted for every 1,000 born alive. And among Hispanics, it's 491 Hispanics aborted for every 1,000 born alive. The black community is the only community where there are more deaths, induced deaths, than, than births. So how in the world can you possibly say there is not access? There's no lack of access, except for lack of access to the truth, but there certainly is no lack of access to the violence of abortion. And yet they keep pushing this. You know, these Democrat pro-abortion lawmakers trying to push the, you know, the repeal of these amendments. And who is that going to hurt more? I mean, racism, as I said before, the ultimate end and the ultimate consequence of racism is death. That's what we're talking about. You know, when Black Lives Matter talks about police brutality, they're talking primarily about deaths. Of course, that whole narrative is false anyway, but that's, it's not, you know, there are, you know, for any police officer who who commits wrong, they need to be held to account 100%. Uh, I, I loathe racism, it's, it's, it's vile, but there is this false narrative that somehow there's an epidemic of black individuals being killed by cops. You know, there are two to three times more white individuals killed by cops, but no one's marching or hashtagging that whole thing. But the same false narrative happens when it comes to the abortion industry. How how do you see racism in every mm-hmm. every other industry? Every not other here. facet of America like nope, nope, not in the industry that profits, you know, two billion dollar industry that kills people. They're not racist. It is so insane. So I just that's why I'll call them out. We call them out through the Ratings Foundation and, and a lot of pro-life organizations are calling that out. But this whole nonsense that somehow it's racist to not want to fund the death of the most marginalized human beings, give me a break. I know, it just pisses me <laughs> off. <laughs> just when I, when, I, when I watch these C-SPAN speeches, <clears throat> I mean, and even, you know, um, I, I don't even know tax status wise, but there's a certain person running for president of the United States who in the past was always pro High Amendment. Now this person is, you know, saying that the Hyde Amendment needs to be repealed because he wants the support of Planned Parenthood and others, and they're spending millions and millions of dollars to elect this person. Um, But, I mean, we need to call these elected officials and these candidates out for this to say, I mean, what you said was perfect. I, like, want to go to a, a thinking Biden rally and ask him that question. How many black babies do you think should be aborted? How how many would be enough for you? Yeah. Because clearly there's not enough being killed. Um, but that's a question that needs to be asked. So, Ryan, I guess I would say, wrapping this up, we've given folks a lot of things, hopefully, to think about. I probably have made like 25% of people mad. I don't know. Anytime I talk about race. I just, it's okay. I'm sorry. Maybe you'll tune in next week and like the episode. Uh, maybe not. Um, but what is it that you think we need to be prepared with? Um, and what is it that the pro-life movement should be looking for and doing in these next coming months, in the coming year, to to appropriately address and talk about the racism of the uh, abortion movement? And like, what do you think would be some of the most effective ways we can really get our message across? Well, one, we can't allow the other side to silence us. They can't, we can't allow them to shame us. And of course, in, in everything that we do, you know, you're supposed to, it, it's hard. The other side can say whatever, crap they want and never have to justify, never have to substantiate it. As pro-lifers, we're the ones who rely on the facts, on the stats, on the history. So I would really encourage, first and foremost, get educated yourself so that you're not terrified to enter into a conversation. You know, there are a lot of great groups out there. You know, you can visit our site too, as radiance.life and and get informed about these issues. As If you're not informed, it's really hard for you to counter what's going on. Don't allow people to silence you because of the hue of your skin. Don't let them silence you because of your gender. I mean, they were perfectly fine with seven males um, giving us Roe v. Wade and you know, seven males in black robes. Isn't that patriarchy? So don't let them silence you because you're a guy. Be bro-life, be as bro-life as you can be. 
Um, I, I think part of what we do is we, I think the best way is to not engage in like these debates. People, some people just love to clash and clash, but ask questions. There are a lot of great social media tools, whether it's Students for Life or whether it's another pro-life organization, Radiance Foundation, there are many others who create great conversation starters. Take a few minutes, visit the sites, share the videos, share a meme. And I think these are great ways to enter conversations. Um, read a book, like Not Equal, Civil Rights Gone Wrong, which help you kind of see some of these things in context and clarity. And we have to undergird everything with love. Mm. You cannot approach the other side. There, there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of shame on the other side. And so, you know, being hostile doesn't help that. So we can be firm and still be loving I'm just, you know, I'm a firm believer in 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. So don't stop speaking. Don't stop engaging. Work with our pregnancy centers. You want to find out how the pro-life movement changes people's narratives? Mm -hmm. Volunteer for your local pregnancy center or your local maternity home or your, you know, your local adoption agency. They, they love when people <laughs> want to help. But that helps to re- direct your mindset when you hear all these lies about, oh, well, the pro-life movement doesn't do this, the pro-life movement doesn't do that, that shatters that. Do not be afraid, whether it's racism, sexism, whatever-ism, don't be afraid to engage in these things because when you're silent, it just strengthens the other side's argument and they, they make advances. We have to be able to push back against these advances. So I just encourage you, being educated, be a factivist. <laughs> I mean, that, that for me is huge because when you, and present it as a question. I think sometimes the best way to have a conversation is just pose something as a question to someone instead of feeling, making them feel like you're bashing them over the head. So those are just I do that on campus sometimes. And then I say, well, I know what you're doing. I'm like, oh, what? I just asked you a question. Well, you're trying to set me up. No, you're setting yourself up because you know the answer you're going to give is going to be inconsistent with the message right. you're trying to to, to, to get that across. No, um, what you were saying about sharing things on social media is so important. Like I don't create graphics or email my team at 1am, like get this, make this a graphic just because I think it's cool. I create it because I want to start a conversation. I think right. this is something that people can take, they can share on their page and then they can start having a conversation with maybe their aunt or their sister right. or their brother-in-law, because the whole point is to have that's, well, I mean, that's what social media was intended for, was to have yes. conversations to bring people together. And in fact, Students for Life, we had this project this year, Ryan, you probably don't even know about, it was called Talk. Talk, talk about life, 250K. And I'm, I am not a sexy marketer like you are. So it, I, my names are always very generic, my program names. Uh, but the goal was to have 250,000 conversations about abortion. We fell short of it by like 25,000 because of COVID. But I was really impressed that we got that much. But if we are measuring in-person conversations and then online. And right. we were encouraging students, like, count the conversations. How many conversations can you have in the course of a year online are you posting content are you posting blogs or graphics or videos that are going to start conversations that you can actually change minds in yes. and save lives we uh one thing we started because of covid was our called search and rescue program no one knows about it because i haven't had time to figure out how to market it but we're going into <laughs> pregnancy chat rooms that are online not pro-life places and actually right. talking to post-abortive and women who are considering abortions. And so far there's been over, I think, 22 babies saved. And it's been like four months of just like six people doing this on a regular basis. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable the difference you can make by being a factivist online. And factivist right. isn't scary. You don't have to go out and get arrested for sidewalk chalking. <laughs> You're Although just, that's okay too. I love those students. we need that I because did. it causes attention. You know, the press doesn't want to cover why we're at Planned Parenthood, but they'll cover maybe that we were arrested for something so unconstitutional as simply sidewalk chalking. So um, I think just 
hammering on your point that you can save lives and you can change minds and you have a great resource in the pro-life movement, in the Radiance Foundation and Students for Life, Live Action, Human Coalition. All of these groups are putting out graphics and memes. And I just learned there's a difference between memes and graphics. So they're different words. Memes are certain things. And then there's graphics and then there's videos and blog posts. You know, you have all of these resources. Don't be afraid to, to speak truth. And that's really what called to do if you know the truth and you're not speaking the truth what does that say about you and what does that say about your supposed love for other people if you're not willing in love to tell them the truth 100 percent. so all right you heard it from ryan ryan how can everyone give everyone your website your hashtags your podcast all over again so they can follow you because they're gonna be like i need to stop listening to Kristen right away and listen to ryan unsubscribe Kristen. only subscribe to ryan no no you can listen to, to us all at the same time come on there's uh, plenty of time it's pandemic time you got lots of time right so you can go to radiance.life that's the easiest way to get to the radiance foundations page we're on social media for now facebook twitter instagram um you can also check out our podcast with my wife, Bethany, my, not my current wife, my forever <laughs> wife. It's so weird. If that is even in my bio, I don't, I don't know, know how, it got in the how bio. that's possible. There's anyway, my wife, Bethany, my best friend, love of my life. Um, but we do a podcast called life has purpose. We cover a lot of different issues, but it's lifehaspurpose.com. Just, so. we, we love speaking the truth and we love talking about how we can play roles in elevating the human condition. Yeah. So make sure you check out Ryan and his wife, uh, Bethany, and their podcast. And check out Radiance Foundation online because I think it's going to be an incredible resource for you all as you move forward and hopefully now speaking boldly about the abortion movement's history of racism and the past and present racism of Planned Parenthood. And our job, guys, is to stop the future racism of Planned Parenthood by defunding them and putting them out of business. So, all right, we'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to tell everybody you know to subscribe because everyone's going to be subscribing to Ryan. I'm going to need help with the ratings. I'm a very competitive person. Bye, guys.